Welcome to daily editorial analysis of Shankari's Academy. So today's date is 27th September 2024. And today's topic of discussion is two editorials. One editorial is taken from the newspaper The Hindu and another from Indian Express. So in the first editorial, we will discuss about the pension schemes evolution in India from the mains perspective detailly. So, in this editorial, we will discuss why there is a requirement of a dedicated law to regulate the FDI in India. So, we will cover both these topics from the mains perspective detailly. Without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. Look at this editorial taken from the newspaper Indian Express. So, this editorial highlights the fact that there is no law to deal with the management of FDI in India. So, let us take any FDI for example, in case of China which is highlighted in this article. We have two aspects. One, we are going to have a economic benefit but at the same time we are also going to have a security concern as well. So, this article highlights the fact that there is no law to deal with the security risk because of the FDI in India. So, this is raising concern with respect to the national security of the India. We have the FEMA Act which is the Foreign Exchange Management Act. This act is dealing with the foreign exchanges in India but it does not deal with the national security aspect. So, with this idea in mind, let us see what is FDI and what are its advantages and how we can promote the FDI in India. Let us start with the main question first. FDI has the potential to transform the India's economy but also presents challenges. Discuss the advantages and concerns associated with the increasing FDI inflows in the key sectors like manufacturing and services. So, here we have to first address about the advantages of FDI. We are also going to deal with challenges because of the increasing FDI flows in India. So, first what FDI is? The foreign direct investment is nothing but an investment which is made by a foreign company or an individual in another country. So, this is called as the FDI. It involves the ownership, control or expansion of the business operations. So, until 1991, we had a closed economy in India. But because of the BOP crisis, we were obliged to form the open economy and bring a economic reforms of LPG which is the liberalization, privatization and globalization reforms. So, since 1991, the government is the rules for the foreign direct investment and India ranks among the top 100 for the ease of doing business. So, these are some important data and trends which you have to remember or need to understand about the FDI in India. So, the total FDI in India is about $990 billions from the year 2000 to 2024. So, for by considering the FDI for the period of 10 years that is from 2014 to 24, the FDI is about 667.41 billion US dollars which accounts for about 67 percentage of total inflow. The FDI for the current year is about 70.95 billion dollars. So, these are some data which you have to remember regarding the FDI. The top sources of FDI in India are first the Mauritius, second Singapore and third US. The top sectors in which the FDI has been made in India are first services, next the computer software and the hardware and third the trading sector. Maharashtra, Karnataka and Gujarat are the top states in which high amount of FDI investment has been made. So, to establish the FDI in India, you have almost three categories or ways in which you can make an investment. First is the automatic routes. So, in this route, 100 percentage of FDI is allowed in India. So, this investment does not need approval of the government to establish the business. So, the main sectors in which automatic route is allowed is IT, manufacturing, single brand retail and infrastructure. Note that in automatic route, you need not get permission or approval from the government to make the establishment. And next is the government route. For this, you have to get the permission or the approval of government because these are some sensitive sectors such as the defense, media and telecom 
because it is attached or linked with the national security of the country. The example of sectors for which government route is approved is defense production, broadcasting and multi-brand retail. So, for the government route to establish the FDI, you have to get the permission or approval from the concerned ministry or department. And thirdly, you have a combination of both automatic and the government route. For example, in insurance sector, you can get 74 percentage up to 74 percentage you can establish the FDI through automatic route and above the 74 percentage it requires the approval of the government. This is called as the government plus automatic route. So, this is applicable to the eligible investors such as the NRI non-resident individuals and foreign companies. So, on whole we have three methods to establish the FDI in India. One is the automatic routes for which you do not need a approval from the government and second you have the government route for which you need a permission from the government and the concerned ministry to establish the FTA and lastly you have the combination of both. So, now we will see what are the issues related to the FTA in India. First is the regulatory challenges. Usually complex regulations are involved with respect to the FTA. This can delay the FDA projects in the country. So, that is why automatic routes in cases such of uh, IT services and single brand manufacturing is introduced to reduce this delay. Another challenge is the national security concern. But in the same automatic route, we are going to allow the FTA without a checking process. So, this can pose security risk in few cases. And third is the sectoral imbalance. Mostly, FDA is concentrated in sectors like IT, and services. FTA is usually not prominent in case of the agriculture in allied sectors. This is also a major concern. Next is the profit repatriation which is nothing but if a foreign company is going to invest in India after getting the profit they may send the asset back to the country from where they came. This can lead to limit the benefits for the local domestic economy and lastly because of the over reliance of the foreign firms this can weaken the domestic industries in India. That is why many schemes such as the Atma Nirbar Bharat and production linked incentive schemes are given to promote the domestic industries in India. So, having discussed about the challenges with respect to the FDI, now we will see what are the measures which we can take to address these challenges. First is the dedicated national security law. At the start of the editorial discussion, we saw there is no dedicated law to deal with the FDI management in India. If we introduce a dedicated security law to manage the FDI, this can reduce the security threats with respect to the FDI. Next is to simplify the regulatory framework. By simplifying the FDI framework, it can speed up the process to attract more FDI in India. We saw that FDI is concentrated only in few sectors and not in other sectors. So, to balance these distribution, we can give incentives to the less developed sector to ensure that there is a balanced economic growth in all the sectors. We saw that the FDI, FDI increase enormously can, can lead to over reliance on the foreign companies. So, we have to strengthen the domestic industries which are located in our country. So, we can formulate policies to enhance the competitiveness of the domestic industries as well. We also need clear regulations and avoid the retrospective taxation to provide a stable environment for the foreign investors. So, these are the measures which we can take to address the challenges and issues we discussed earlier. So, with this we will conclude the discussion on this editorial and move to the next one. Take a look at this editorial taken from the newspaper The Hindu. So, an opportunity to rethink the India's pension system. So, this editorial discusses about the evolution of Indian pension system starting from the old pension system to the new pension system and the currently proposed unified pension system. So, this editorial writer is asking to return to the welfare approach of the pension system. So, on this backdrop, let us discuss about the Indian pension system detailly from the mains perspective. So, in this discussion, we will see about the main features of the pension system. We will also see what are the issues in the old and the new pension system and how these issues are rectified in the currently proposed unified pension system. 
So let's start with the question first. Discuss the evolution of the pension system in India and what is the role of unified pension system in ensuring the financial inclusion? What are the challenges faced by the UPS? So the first part of the question. So the first part of the question we have to address what is the evolution of the system that is the old pension system, the new pension system and the unified pension system. So in the second part we will address what way the UPS is contributing to the financial inclusion and third part we have to address what are the challenges in this UPS. So for this question you can write the answer in the comment section and we will review that. So first we will start with the features of the old pension system. So, first feature is that they have a defined benefit model. It means that they will have a guaranteed amount at the end of retirement based on the last drawn salary. So, this is nothing but they have a fixed guaranteed amount. Let us say it will be 50 percentage of the basic salary along with it they will also have a dearness allowance. So, here you have to note that this fixed amount is totally contributed by the government. There is no contribution from the employee side. So, this way this the old pension scheme is called as the non-contributory model because no contribution is made from the worker side. The total contribution for the pension is done by the government. The third feature would be there will be a lifelong income secured from the market fluctuation. Here it is directly given from the revenue of the government that is the source would be either taxpayers money or from the government treasury. So, it is not bound to any market fluctuation. So, they have a financial security and a secured pension throughout their lifetime. This gives a financial security to the pension receiver. Another important feature of this old pension scheme is that after the death of the pension receiver, it is transferred to the spouse of the worker. So, this ensures the financial security to the spouse as well for a long time period. The fifth feature is the indexation to the inflation. This is nothing but they will adjust the pension based on the fluctuation in the inf inflation. So, inflation is nothing but the persistent rise of price of goods. So, whenever there is a inflation, they will also adjust the pension to balance the price rise during the inflation. This is called as the indexation to the inflation. So, this can be done by hiking the DA which is the dearness allowance. And the last important feature of this old pension scheme is the gratuity and benefit. So, after the period of retirement, they will receive a gratuity that is they will receive a lump sum of money along with the pension. Added to that, they will also receive the medical benefits and other perks. So, in short, the main features will be a defined benefit pension which is contributed totally by the government. They will have a long term security in terms of finance and this is also transferred to the spouse in case of death. They will adjust this pension according to the inflation in the market. At last, they will also give a gratitude or a lump sum money at the end of the retirement. These are some basic features of the old pension scheme. So, with this, let us see the issues with respect to this. Here, you have to note that the pension is totally contributed by the government. This can give a financial burden to the government side. And next would be with the increasing life expectancy and the increasing workforce, this can further increase the financial burden to the government. So, the main source of this pension would be the taxpayers money and the government treasury. This is increasing the burden of government to give the pension to the workers. So, these are the issues with respect to the old pension scheme. So, with this let us see about the new pension scheme. So, the problem earlier in the old pension scheme was that the entire contribution is made by the government. So, but in case of the new pension scheme, the contribution is made both by the employee as well as for the government. So, a defined proportion of the salary is contributed by both of them. 10 percentage of salary of the employee is given by the employee and the other 10 percentage is provided by the government. This is called as the defined contribution system of the new pension scheme. So, here you can see it has rectified the problem of the non-contribution system in the old pension scheme.
So after getting the contribution from both the government and the employee, this amount is invested. So it can be invested in case of equity, it can be invested in corporate bonds, it can be invested in the government bonds. Here the employee also has a provision to decide what proportion of fund they can invest in each of the following. So they have a investment choice that is they can choose the pension fund managers as well as what proportion of fund they can allocate in each of the following that is the equity, corporate board and the government bond. So, there are two types of option. One is the active choice where the employee will choose the proportion of fund which has to be allocated to each class. But in the auto choice, they will automatically that is the government will automatically adjust the allocation based on the age. If suppose the person is young, they will invest in the equity. If they will invest in further secure models such as the government and corporate model. Talking about the withdrawal rules of the new pension scheme, here you have to note that at the end of retirement, they can get a lump sum of about 60 percentage of the corpus and the 60 percentage of amount is actually tax free in nature and another 40 percentage they can invest in the annuity model. Annuity is nothing but they will invest a lump sum of money in term they will get a fixed amount over a period. This is called as the annuity. So, this 40 percentage can be invested in the annuity for which they will get the pension. So, this is in case of retirement in the age of 60 age, but they are wanted to withdraw the money before the age of 60, only 20 percentage of money can be withdrawn and another 80 percentage has to be invested in the case of annuity. This is the condition with respect to the withdrawal rules. Another important feature of the new pension scheme is the portability. So, here the, it is portable across job which means they can continue with the same account even if they are going to change the job or also if they are going to shift the job from the government to the private sector. Here you have to note that the new pension scheme was first introduced in the year 2004 which covered only the government employees. But in 2009, it also covered the government as well as the private entities. So, what are the issues with respect to this? One is the market risk. The market is can have fluctuation which can affect the returns of the investment. So, this is a major problem with respect to the investment in the new pension scheme. It is also dependent on the annuity rate which can further elevate the risk of returns on the investment made in that. So, there is no fixed pension amount that you get if you invest in the annuity model. It is bound to fluctuation. There is also a complexity in fund management. For example, you have to decide what is the proportion of fund you are going to invest in each of the following that is equity, corporate and the government bond. This might be complex to some of the subscribers. So, these are the issues with respect to the new pension scheme. So, that is why government of India has proposed for the unified pension scheme which has rectified the problems in case of old pension scheme as well as new pension scheme. The first main feature of this is it is universal. Unified pension scheme is available to the government employees, the private employees as well as the informal workers. So, the inclusion of informal workers in the pension scheme is showing the inclusivity of the government. And next is the voluntary participation. So, they can voluntarily en enroll in the unified pension scheme. There is no compulsion to participate in this unified pension scheme. Next is the defined contribution. So, this is same that of the new pension scheme where uh, defined contribution is made by the government as well as the employee. Here, the non-contributing nature of the old pension scheme is rectified. Next feature is the flexible contribution. Based on the capacity of the employee, he can contribute accordingly. So, there is no compulsion he has to contribute at 10 percentage of the basic uh, uh, salary. He can contribute based on his capacity and requirement. And the fifth feature would be portable, same in the case of NPS. He can continue with the same account even if uh, wanted, he wanted to switch jobs or j switch the sectors. Talking about the investment option, this is similar to the feature of new pension scheme where he has the opportunity or the decision making to invest what proportion of fund he wanted to invest in 
the corporate and the government bonds. So, even in the unified pension scheme, the subscribers have an opportunity to purchase the annuity model from this certain portion of their amount. They can also have a tax benefit which means that they will get financial incentives for investing in the unified pension scheme. There is also a simple enrollment process to join in this unified pension scheme. So, these are the keywords which you have to remember to understand about the unified pension scheme. So, another important feature of this unified pension scheme is that it offers a safety net by providing a minimum pension amount in case of the volatility as well as uncertainty in the market condition. It is also aiming to secure a pension system for all the sectors. That is, we already said it, it provides a pension scheme to informal workers as well. So, this is going to combine the welfare and a market linked growth to the people of the India. So, with this, we will conclude the discussion on this editorial. So, we saw detailly about the each of the pension schemes, starting from the old pension scheme, new pension scheme and the unified pension scheme. We also saw what are the drawbacks in each of the pension scheme. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedback, says comment and do not forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.